we are on. I want to thank everybody for joining us today. And it always amazes me how little tiny Santa Barbara has been so filled with history. So who would think that things like aviation would have a grand start in our small town? And it's just sort of what I've always said, you know, with Santa Barbara, you can't just throw a stick without hitting history. In fact, if it wasn't for aviation, my family would not have come to Santa Barbara. My father was a test pilot and came out to Santa Barbara in the late 50s, early 60s with General Electric. They were doing uh, top secret work. And that's what brought our family out to Santa Barbara. And so we will start off with a little bit of aviation history here first. And of course, it all starts with the Wright brothers at Kitty Hawk, North Carolina, December 17th, 1903. And this is the, the photograph taken of the first flight. And they had only, it only went um, something like 120 feet, but they got off the ground and they went. And so that's what kind of got our, got America going into flight. And it didn't take very long before improvements were made and everybody's trying to do out, trying to do outdo everybody else with design work and engines and ideas. And by 1910, the first aviation meet in America was held in Los Angeles. And it was January 10th through 20th, 1910 at the Dominguez Field. And over a quarter million people over those 11 days came to see balloon ascensions and aviators. And it was in a, a very successful meeting. Uh, the people paid a dollar and a quarter for a ticket. There were $75,000 in prizes for the daring aviators that came out. And the, uh, there was a profit for the promoters of $60,000. So this was a highly successful, highly successful aviation meeting. Well, so that's January, 1910. And Little Santa Barbara got the notice in December of 1910 that there was to be a grand air exhibition at Hope Ranch Park, starring the daring Captain Ivy Baldwin. And this is how fast things moved in Santa Barbara back in 1910. It was only December 24th that there was mention of the hope that they could secure Captain Ivy Baldwin to come down from San Francisco and give this air exhibition. Two days later, they had the ticket prices advertised in the newspaper. By December 27th, this is just like four days later, his plane was shipped from San Francisco and they'd already arranged for the Southern Pacific Railroad to have special trains, as it mentions at the bottom here, leaving Santa Barbara at 1 p.m. for Hope Ranch. There was a siding at Hope Ranch so they could get the trains off there to depart people. Can you imagine trying to put on an air exhibition in Santa Barbara today? Just the meetings alone to decide if we could even have an air exhibition would take two or three years not to mention the environmental impact from it. But here within six days, they now had the exhibition scheduled. They had the ticket prices, Southern Pacific arranging special trains. How do you ship a airplane on a, with the Southern Pacific even from San Francisco with one day notice? And the mayor of Santa Barbara had already said that he would flirt with death and he would fly with Captain Ivy Baldwin as did a reporter, 20-year-old reporter, uh, Miss Emma Hild, and she was a reporter for the Morning Press, and she said she would go up with Captain Ivy Baldwin in this plane. And so Santa Barbara was all abuzz. It was ready to roll and go well. So who is Captain Ivy Baldwin? Well, there he is on the right. His actually, his name was really William Ivy, and uh, he started off at 10 years old. He was a tightrope walker. Then he joined up with two brothers, Tom and Sam Baldwin. So he changed his name to Ivy Baldwin so they could change their name to the, ba so it could be the Baldwin brothers. And they did a balloon ascensions. And this is the 1880s, 1890s. And they would do a balloon ascension and he would jump out with a parachute from 2,500 feet. And I'm just amazed that someone with the, the pioneer parachuting of the day, how daring that would be to be jumping out of a balloon at 2,500 feet. Now, as a balloonist, he also joined the Army Signal Corps in the late 1890s, 
and was in Cuba. And so they would raise up the balloon so he could look down and see what the enemy troops in Cuba were doing. And in this position, he became the first uh, American aviator to be shot down. The soldiers saw him doing his spying, as it were, and seeing where their, their fortifications were. So they shot his balloon down and he survived. And uh, also did quite well in the airplane business because unlike many of his other pioneer aviators, he survived and he kept up his skills. On his 82nd birthday, he walked a tightrope 125 feet above ground. So his balance and skills were still going. And he died in 1953 at age 87. But here he is now, gusty winds prevent the flight of his biplane across the Golden Gate, but now he's headed to Santa Barbara. Well, one of his competitors, a man named Didier Masson, a Frenchman who started flying with the French aviator Louis Pallon and came to America and did some of the work with uh, Louis Pallon and started to then do daredevil stunts by himself. So he was a well-known aviator. He had been at the Dominguez Field. And so it was announced that he would come to Santa Barbara as well. And what he decided, he thought he would be at the, it was now Pershing Park, which was the ballpark back then. So he decided that he was going to fly there, it was going to be better. But something happened, so he changed his mind. And so now it became the daring aviation meet of the two, day, of the two daring aviators. Um, so there's his plane, and he's now uh, headed out. He was also, Baldwin was old. Baldwin was 44, and this guy was just 24 years old, the, the uh, Frenchman Didier Masson. So now the newspaper ads mention the grand aviation meet with the two daring aviators, the train times, the cost for admission. And at the same time, there was an advertisement uh, about Roosevelt and an airplane flight. And you can find this video of Roosevelt in his airplane flight. It's on YouTube. So look for Roosevelt airplane flight. And what was kind of sad about this announcement was uh, on Saturday, December 31st, Captain Baldwin, while practicing, made five flights out of Hope Ranch. So these were the first airplane flights in Santa Barbara. And his daring accomplishments were overshadowed by a large headline about two aviators that were killed. Uh, one is Arch Huxley, and he was at Dominguez Field, and he fell from 300 feet in front of his mother and crashed. And it was Huxley that had flown Roosevelt uh, back in October of that year. So you think how daring that was for Roosevelt, who was an ex-president at that time, to fly in the plane and hear the daring aviator that flew Roosevelt crashes uh, on December 31st. The other uh, aviator was a man named John Massant, and he was in uh, New outside of New Orleans, and he was flying, and a big wind came up, and it actually knocked him out of the plane. I guess they didn't have safety belts then or any type of thing, so he uh, fell out of his airplane and missed the propeller and then just plunged to the ground and died. But this is kind of what uh, it was all about, was uh, the daring men, and are they going to crash? Will they make it? So everybody's headed out to Hope Ranch on January 1st on Sunday and on January 2nd to Monday. Uh, this is the Hope Ranch Polo Field. Uh, the Potter Hotel was having had their country club out there. And up at the top of the photo here, you can see the Potter Hotel Country Club. So they had special seating for the guests of the Potter Hotel overlooking the field where these aviators will be taking off. Uh, Captain Ivy Baldwin had a hard time with his plane. He did not get it up in the air on January 1st or 2nd, but on uh, Didier Masson made several flights. And here's Masson taking off from Hope Ranch Field on, Jan on Monday, January 2nd. And what blows people away, he did his stunts, he did a little, he did rolls and he did, uh, did loops. And then he uh, kept on going and people thought, well, this must be the end of the show, but where is he going? He's supposed to land here. So he made several spirals and this headed off over towards Santa Barbara. So people jumped on the train, people jumped in their cars, their bicycles, their carriages, and they started following where Masson was going. Masson flew along the edge of the Mesa overlooking Santa Barbara. And so you think about Santa Barbara in 1911, there's no highway, there's very few cars, there's no noise. Think of the noise of this airplane 
flying over the city. Every eye is looking up saying, what the heck is that? And people are now jumping into whatever transportation they had and trying to follow this airplane. The sheriff did note that most of the speed limits in Santa Barbara were broken that afternoon as everybody is flying down whatever road they can in the automobile terminology or carriage terminology of flying, uh, following the Solon's airplane. So he's flying over the city. The computer just, just got stuck, there we go. Uh, now heading down toward the beach. And so we're, we're looking down Haley Street here off to the right. And then he's headed over the beachfront and uh, there's the big Potter Hotel along the beachfront. So he comes out over West Beach and he flies over the top of the bathhouse uh, here. And this is a Japanese tea garden and he buzzes the top of the Japanese tea garden and everybody is looking up amazed at this thing. And then he heads towards the Potter Hotel, towards the rooftop. There's an open rooftop up here. And everybody has been, you know, they're hearing all this noise. They're rushing up to the rooftop. So Masson comes along and actually just buzzes the top of the rooftop. The newspapers later refer to this as an episode of biplane-itis, where everybody was up there listening for the sound of this airplane as it passed overhead. So Masson buzzes the top of the Potter Hotel dips down across the front lawn and heads out towards Stern's Wharf. Banking over Stern's Wharf, he then heads back to the Potter. Now, this is Chapala Street over here. This is the entrance to the Potter. And this is, if De La Vina Street went through, it would be right about here. So this squared lawn area is about 450 feet wide. Masson is going to land on the front of the Potter. So he comes out over Stern's Wharf, comes back in and starts heading in low to try and hit this lawn. And this is the view coming in. He's got to clear these palm trees on the boulevard, uh, miss this lady here and the water sprinklers going on and land on the potter. Now, I have not been able to find out if these planes had brakes back then. I don't think they had any type of braking system. So he's coming in and by God, he lands on the front lawn of the Potter Hotel He's immediately surrounded, given champagne. He's getting rock star status and amazing that he could land within 450 feet on the Potter Hotel front lawn. So it's a perfect landing, great headlines. Uh, he got some $1,500 for doing his flight uh, as well. And his uh, Captain Baldwin got $1,000 even though he didn't make it in time for the exhibition, but nobody went away unhappy from this exhibition. Meanwhile, Masson leaves Santa Barbara, goes to Los Angeles to do a, a first. He uh, carries the Los Angeles Times to San Bernardino. And so that's a headline thing, the first newspaper delivered by the airplane. In 1913, he heads down to Mexico and he is hired by the revolutionists down there. Uh, to So he becomes the Air Force for the Mexican Revolution. He drops some bombs on government gunboats, and that is the first aerial bombing of a ship uh, done by him. But then he kind of gets uh, disenfranchised by the whole thing and uh, leaves. During World War I, uh, Masson joins the Lafayette Escadrille in France, being the American volunteer aviators. And uh, later he moves to Mexico and he works for Pan American Airlines and dies in 1950. So another one of the of the few aviators that these, these early pilots that uh, lived to tell his stories. 1915, in early January, there's talk of an amazing sky festival with Beachy. What's Beachy? Well, before there was Cher, Madonna, Prince, and all these one word names, there was Beachy. And everyone across America knew who Beachy was. Lincoln Beachy, America's most startling, daring, and amazing aviator. And as you can see here, it says he's flying upside down. And you can imagine the types that are having to put type upside down against everything they've ever learned. But uh, he's going to fly upside down. He's going to loop the loop. And unlike the previous Sky Festival, uh, this one took three months to put together, a lot of contracts to sign and things to happen. And uh, 
Lincoln Beachy started off uh, working for the Baldwin brothers that we mentioned that Ivy Baldwin had worked with. He was a ground crewman for their, uh, for their balloon shows. He flew with uh, early aviator and inventor Glenn Curtis, and he took a prize to be the first person to fly over Niagara Falls before a crowd of 150,000 people. So he flew over the falls, through the mist, under the honeymoon bridge, over 20 feet of water. And this was how headlines were made for these aviators back then. The first person to circle the Statue of Liberty, the first person to fly over a bridge, under a bridge, across a channel, over a city. There was, every day there was notes about some aviator being the first person to do something. And Beachy was well known for his uh, looping the loop and his various tricks flying upside down. Here he is in San Francisco, his hometown. Great advertising, he had his name Beachy spelled out across the top wing of the airplane, and he would do loops. He would do the dive of death. The dive of death, he would take his plane way up, turn it around, and just go straight down. He'd take his hands off the controls, and people could see that he's flying without his hands. And at the last minute, he would pull back on the stick and bring the plane out of it. And he was very competitive. If somebody did 14 loops, which was a, you know, the, the, uh, the, the uh, what do you call it? the world's record to do 14 loops, he wouldn't do 14, he would go back and do 28. If somebody did 28, he would do 56. He was always outdoing anybody. He raced a train, touched his wheels on the roof of the train. He and racer Barney Oldfield would do exhibition racing and they would take turns as to who would win. So it wasn't always the same e event. So they made sure that the crowd got quite a thrill. Uh, several times he quit flying because he was concerned that um, because of his example of doing more and doing better was leading other aviators to try things, which many of them died, were friends of his. And so he would feel really bad. And so he would uh, quit flying. In 1914, he actually dived the White House and Congress in a mock attack, saying that, you know, this is the future. You know, you've got to be prepared for airplane attacks. And this is what's going to happen. Uh, they ignored him, of course. So never, now he's coming to Santa Barbara to do his aerial exhibition. Uh, here he is out at Hope Ranch, where they also took off from. Uh, this is Lincoln Beachy here on the left. Glenn Curtis, the aviator and inventor on the right. And Beachy always dressed really nice. He was always dressed in a great suit and tie. Um, Gave, always gave impressive performances, and he certainly did in Hope Ranch. He flew out of Hope Ranch, did his loops, did his dives of death. He flew inverted. He did rolls, did all the things. The only problem was uh, he had done a, a great exhibition, and he had just finished a loop, and his plane tumbled, and he barely got control of it. He fell some 1,500 feet, and he... Uh, came out of the loop by flying into a grove of trees at the edge of Hope Ranch. And he wasn't hurt, but uh, it, demol it pulled the wings off his plane pretty badly. And so he, at that point said, I'll never fly again. But within a few days, of course, he was flying again. It's, uh, I just throw a, note, a side note here. There's a gentleman named Herb Callis, who was the promoter for the Hope Ranch exhibition. And Herb Callis is a great Santa Barbara promoter. I come, ac come across his name so many times. I interviewed him later in life, but he never talked about the Glenn, about the uh, Lincoln Beachy show. He told me about his, uh, ex, his work at the Potter Theater and some other things that he had done. Well, Lincoln Beachy left Santa Barbara. Everybody was quite satisfied and happy. Uh, he went back to San Francisco and about two weeks after his flight in Santa Barbara, he was flying at the Pan Pacific Exhibition in San Francisco. He had a crowd of 50,000 people at the fairgrounds, and he had his new designed uh, Beachy Eaton monoplane. And there was a crowd of some 200,000 on the hills around San Francisco watching Lincoln Beachy do his exhibitions. And he was doing about 100 miles an hour, doing inverted flights and his normal loops. And then he was pulling back, coming out of his loop, and the wings collapsed. And this is his plane heading into San Francisco Bay. And he actually survived the crash with a broken leg, 
but he drowned because he couldn't undo his safety harness. Orville Wright said, an airplane in the hands of Lincoln Beachy is pure poetry. His mastery is a thing of beauty to watch. He is the most wonderful flyer of all. And it is said that uh, millions of Americans were able to watch Beachy before he died. So he was really one of the most well-known aviators and daring uh, stunt pilots of that era. Meanwhile, at the Pan Pacific Exhibition, there were two brothers, Alan and Malcolm Lockheed, and they had a seaplane and they were also giving rides to spectators. They were trying to start their airplane company. And so they were charging admission and raising money for their airplane company by giving rides at the, at the Pan Pacific Exhibition in San Francisco and doing quite well. Finishing the exhibition, they came to Santa Barbara and here on West Beach, just at the foot of Castillo Street, they brought down their airplane, the Model G, the Lockheed Model G, and built this ramp, getting city support to do so. It was, took a little bit of problems with them. You can see uh, where they are here, their Stearns Wharf in the background, and here's their Model G airplane. And they called it the Model G. You know, everybody started at that time with Model A, Model B, Model C. They started with Model G because they wanted people they didn't want people to think it was their first plane. So they figured if they had Model G, people would say, oh, that's your seventh plane. You know, you guys are, you guys are doing great. So they came to Santa Barbara and doing the same thing. They had their seaplane. They charged people for rides to go out over the channel. And that's how they were funding their company. They launched their company at the corner of State and Mason Street at a man named William Rust, who had a garage there. It was an auto shop. And they started building their airplanes in William Rust garage their estate in Mason Street. This is a photo showing of the, uh, the Lockheed Aviation Company gathered at West Beach. Now, the gentleman on the left is, is unknown. Uh, this gentleman is named Tony Staldman, and he was the head of production. He first saw Alan Lockheed fly in Chicago in 1910. He then became a pilot and was hired on to Lockheed Aviation. And in 1980, at the annual meeting for the Lockheed Company, uh, he was 95 years old and Lockheed's oldest ex-employee. And he gave a lot of great interviews and history of working with the Lockheed brothers. I think one of the last people to have known and flown with the Lockheed brothers. The gentleman next to him is Burton Rodman. He was the owner of the Weston Machine and Foundry in Santa Barbara. He was a car dealer and an investor and a director of the Lockheed Aviation Company. Uh, this is Alan Lockheed. And I didn't mention it before, but the name was actually spelled L-O-U-G-H-E-A-D, which is Loghead, as people pronounce it, but it's Scottish, so it's Lockheed. And so they eventually changed the name to the spelling you see here at the bottom, L-O-C-K-H-E-E-D. And, uh, but originally it was like Loghead. So that's Alan Lockheed. This gentleman here is Jack Northrup. He was a Santa Barbara High School graduate in 1913, and he was the first engineer for the Lockheed uh, Aviation Company. He later went on to form his own aviation company, Northrop Aviation, and the uh, stealth bomber and stealth fighters that we see today owe part of their heritage to the flying wing that he designed. And uh, Jack Northrop stayed in Santa Barbara, or he passed on in Santa Barbara. I think he lived in Hope Branch. This gentleman up here in the gun turret of the seaplane, this is a plane that they're developing for the Army or for the Navy. And uh, this is Malcolm Lockheed. Uh, curiously, he was on the opposite side of the war in Mexico with Didier Masson, so he was with the government forces. Uh, while in Santa Barbara, one of the things that Malcolm Lockheed worked on was hydraulic brakes, and so he invented the hydraulic brake. For those of us that have enjoyed our British cars, MGs, and Austin Healy's, we all know the Lockheed brake uh, components. The company was long gone from the Lockheed's by the time we got these things, but nevertheless, Malcolm Lockheed gets the credit for inventing the four-wheel hydraulic brakes. And so that's our Lockheed Aviation Company in Santa Barbara. Uh, this is a delightful shot of the West Beach launching ramp. And 
there's another ramp down here. So I'm not quite sure what the deal is going on here, but there's a second plane down here and another Lockheed plane uh, focused right there. This is a celebration where the Lockheeds uh, got a contract with the Navy for their seaplane. And this is uh, Flying A, the American film company here in Santa Barbara. That's their actress, Margarita Fisher, who has broken a bottle of champagne or something across the front of the airplane. So everybody's gathered up to celebrate this great moment in Lockheed Aviation. And there you can see the L-O-U-G-H head, the Loghead Aviation Company. Well, continuing to raise money for the company, they had the greatest sport of all, fly on the Big Ten passenger Lockheed seaplane for $5, safer than motoring, 5,000 passengers carried without incident. And they've got seven or so shows a day or times a day that you can schedule your flights. They later reduced the, the uh, cost from $5 to $2.50. And so that's kind of how they were financing their airplane company. I really like this shot here. Here's the twin engine Lockheed airplane coming back, a seaplane coming back to the ramp. And look at the kids in the water right in front of the ramp. Here's an airplane coming in for a landing, taxing up to the rampway, and there's kids playing in the water. Think about the liability today and the insurance problems that they would have with a, a situation like that. But back then, if your kids were stupid enough to be in front of an airplane when it landed and something happened, it was pretty much your own fault. In 1918, the Lockheeds attempted to do a transcontinental flight, and so they took their twin-engine seaplane, put wheels on it. This was the Lockheed F-1A. This is out in Goleta at the Gould Ranch, which is off of which, what is now Hollister Avenue, and the plane is uh, going across the plowed field out there. And here's the next shot. One of the problems with having a using farm fields to take off and land was the the ground got awfully soft if it was muddy or if there had been rain. And so here's a team of horses trying to pull the plane across the, uh, the muddy field and get ready for another exhibition launch. The transcontinental flight did not go well. They had a few incidents, a few fires, a few small crashes. And so the plane never made it as the transcontinental uh, flight that I intended, but the Lockheed company did get some government contracts and did move on and finally left Santa Barbara. Uh, this photo came from the John Fritchie collection, a great friend for the Santa Barbara Genealogy Society and the Santa Barbara Historical Museum. John had a, an amazing collection which he has given to the Historical Museum and he, has, uh, he just passed on uh, late last year. And one of the things John did was down at the corner of State and Mason, where the Lockheed uh, Aviation Company was started, uh, John took this old payphone booth and the phone was long gone. And so he worked with the city, it took a lot of work to put up a plaque honoring the Lockheed brothers. And this, tile, this part of the tile plaque here was copied from a billboard that was down, I think, around Carpentria or Summerland. Uh, advertising the Lockheeds so you could come up to Santa Barbara and fly the greatest sport of all fly today. So this is a copy of that billboard. And um, so John paid to have it installed and put out there. And John, um, they when they redid the, for the redoing of whatever you call it, the, uh, oh, I forget the name of the, of the complex down there, but all that new stuff down there on State and Mason, uh, they did tear this down, but they saved the plaque and moved it back. So you can still go down to State and Mason and read the fine wording on the plaque and thank John Fritchie for doing that for us. In another aviation first for Santa Barbara, in April of 1920 for the second annual uh, Santa Barbara horse show, uh, it was the first flight of a horse. And they tried a few days to, it took a few days to get this horse up to Santa Barbara. The, it was a Shetland pony whose name was Mercury because the company that brought the uh, horse up here was Mercury Aviation. And one of the problems with getting the horse into the plane was the uh, so Society Prevention of Cruelty for Animals thought it would be cruel to put a horse in an airplane. They were very concerned about the horse's safety. And you have to kind of laugh about this thinking, well, they weren't concerned about the people on the plane that were coming up. They were concerned about the horse. So. Anyway, Santa Barbara gained yet another first with the first flight of a horse 
from Los Angeles to Santa Barbara in time for the uh, horse show. Now, this kid here looks like Harry Potter. And this young girl here looks like trouble. Well, as all these things at 1911 that we mentioned going on with D.D.A. Masson and Captain Ivy Baldwin, another thing was happening, and it was this gentleman here named Earl Ovington. In 1911, Earl Ovington became the first person to fly airmail. And here's the postmaster Morgan, somebody named Hitchcock, an unidentified person, handing Earl Ovington a stack of mail. And on September 23rd, 1911, he flew the mail from Garden City, New York to Mineola, New York, and then tossed the bag out. It had some 1,200 so postcards and 600 plus letters in it. And apparently when the bag hit the ground, it sort of exploded and blew everything out of it. But nevertheless, it was the first uh, post, the first airmail. And he got a license as the first airmail pilot and got great notoriety from it. And here he is uh, with his wife, uh, Adelaide Ovington. They met on a ship. They were coming back from, uh, from Europe. And she had heard about this dashing pilot on board and thought he was the most handsome thing ever. And she was an actress. And to her great fortune, one night the captain of the ship uh, invited her to his table along with Mr. Ovington. And so for the next couple of nights, they sat across from each other at the captain's table and romance ensued. They came back to uh, America and she thought, well, I'll never see this gentleman again. But sure enough, he found out where she lived and sent a note inviting her out to the airfield to see his airplane. And so she came out, uh, saw the airplane and the press was there taking photographs of him with his airplane. And then they said, oh, uh, let's get Mrs. Ovington in the picture too. So she wasn't Mrs. Ovington, but she obliged and got her picture taken. And so the newspapers printed Mr. and Mrs. Ovington at the airfield with his uh, airship. And she said, oh my God, what am I gonna do? People think that we're married. And so Earl Ovington said, well, I guess we'll get married. And so that was their courtship, the romance and son of a gun, they got married. And she actually didn't know what to call him because she'd only known him as Mr. Ovington. And she felt uncomfortable calling him, um, I just forgot his first name, Earl. <laughs> So nevertheless, they got married and things worked out. And he, they moved to Santa Barbara. In Santa Barbara, Ovington was an amazing person. He was an engineer. He was a yachtsman, an aviator. Here in Santa Barbara, he became the first Commodore of the Santa Barbara Yacht Club. He was also an inventor of small house designs, which are popular now, but he was making one room houses and it was based on his wife's suggestion after they were out on a, um, a sailboat for a while. And she said, why couldn't we have a house like that? Everything has a nice place to fit and everything's perfect. And he thought, yes, every time you got to clean your house, you got to move all the furniture. So he designed houses with all these little pocket doors and uh, tables that folded out of the wall and benches and things like that. So he uh, developed these small houses. Then he also bought... Um, a tract of some 84 acres known as the Hamburger Subdivision, which isn't much of a romantic name. So he renamed it Casa Loma, the house on the hill, and started selling houses there. And so the Casa Loma, it would be between today's De La Vina Street and Samarkand. So it's the first couple of blocks going into the Samarkand. And so that's his uh, Casa Loma housing tract. Now, in addition, he didn't quit his aviation. So in addition, he built the Casa Loma Airfield. So here's State Street, also known as Hollister at that time. Here's Samarkand Drive. And there is no Las Positas. Here's Las Positas, or San Roque Road right here. Las Positas doesn't yet exist. This whole area here will later become Loretta Plaza. Macaw Avenue will run along right about here. But he instead developed this area as the, his Casa Loma airfield. There's the hangar down there. And pretty much this is the runway coming along there. Here's a view of the Ovington hangar up there at the Casa Loma airfield. Well, pretty soon as the Samarkand and Casa Loma got more and more houses on it, 
they decided that uh, the city decided that it was too noisy and so people had complaints. So Ovington had to shut down his airfield out there. Well, that wasn't the end of the Ovington hangar, however. A gentleman bought the hangar and took it out to Goleta in 1938 and it was moved to the corner of Hollister and Rutherford Avenue. And it was Joseph uh, Moore Company and he sold Caterpillar tractors and uh, farming equipment. So you can see the top of the hangar here and the hangar doors right there. It's still there today. It's the Santa Cruz Market and uh, Tom Mondugno owns it and runs it. And Tom does a great blog on Goleta history. So uh, check it out sometime. Uh, GoletaHistory.com. Uh, Mark Sanchez, just a shout out to Mark. Mark uh, used his drone to take these pictures and Mark has done a phenomenal job of doing some great video work of, of Santa Barbara and buildings, et cetera, with his, uh, with his drones up there. And there is a historic plaque on the front of this building. So if you go out to the Santa Cruz Mark, you can read the history of the, of the Ovington Terminal. Uh, Ovington continued to make the news because any time there was something to do with airmail, they would always get him involved. And so uh, there was a national air race, races from Santa Monica to Cleveland, and this airmail was carried by Earl Ovington. And another one here, the first airmail from Santa Barbara in, I think, 1938. And here's Richard Ambrose, head of Ambrose Lumber Company, and also the head of the um, also, he was the postmaster for Santa Barbara, so he signed it. Now, Mr. Ovington had passed away by this time, so Mrs. Ovington signed the, uh, signed the front of this uh, airmail uh, envelope. And I don't know who had this stamp, but it's on all these different uh, Ovington airmail pieces. It's always got that stamp on it. Well, there was other airfields in Santa Barbara besides what Mr. Ovington had put together. Uh, the Zenith Aviation Company in 1919 was formed and they were over on the lower east side around by what is now Por the Mar and uh, in that area by behind the Marmonte, which wasn't open at that time. And their airfield was the old Santa Barbara racetrack. And they did the same thing that, this is 1919, the same time that we have the Lockheeds and uh, Frank Croxford and Arnold Popick were two retired aviators. And so they opened the Zenith Aviation Company and they were selling airplanes. And it's kind of neat that uh, they were at the Hotel Belvedere, which was the renamed Potter Hotel. So where Didier Masson landed on the front lawn, these two guys now had nice rooms and they were doing instructions, acrobatics and carrying passengers for their flights. And Curiously or fun enough, two of their first students were George and his sister, Esther Hammond. And I don't have the photograph, but the Hammond estate known as Bonnie Mead, uh, across from the Biltmore, down from the Biltmore Hotel. The George Hammond later had his own airfield and his own airplanes landing at Bonnie Mead all the time. And he's noted, and there's a, quite a few Santa Barbara Historical Museum uh, photographs and notes about this, about him flying out to San Miguel Island to deliver uh, groceries and supplies to the Lester family out there. So kind of neat, Zenith Aviation here in Santa Barbara. Uh, they later built a, a hangar at the corner of Cabrillo and Milpas. I haven't found out what happened to that, but in 1920, they got the permits to build it. And they also moved their uh, airfield closer. And I haven't found out exactly where their airfield was at that point. At the same time that's happening in 1919, we had the Bauhaus family and the Bauhaus brothers uh, develop planes in Carpentria, and they are credited with designing the first round barrel-shaped uh, airplanes and their own design flying out in Carpentria. Uh, sadly, they had a crash in 1920. It killed William, uh, shown here with his wife, uh, and the airplane had killed William and injured his brother Lewis. And uh, Lewis later died a few years later uh, flying over the Samarkand area. So here's the Bauhaus plane in Carpentria. So competition for the Lockheeds to have another innovative pair of brothers uh, building planes in Santa Barbara. Carpentria also had the first, uh, they had an airplane, uh, they had a landing field out there and a hangar. And this is at the corner of 
what it, I think it's called, um, uh, not Trash Road, but uh, anyway, so this is Carpentria Avenue along here and Dump Road along, along there. And so this was the Carpentria Airport and this opened in the late twenties. It was known as the Chadbourne and Dons Airfield because Jack Chadbourne and Bob Dons of Santa Barbara, uh, Jack Chadbourne from Montecito and Bob Dons of Santa Barbara uh, put this airfield together. And you can see it was quite popular. There's quite a few airplanes out there in the field. And fortunately for us, here's another great piece that made it, oops, I forgot to put the picture in. Anyway, it's still there at the corner of uh, Dump Road and Carpentria Avenue. So you can uh, go out there and see it. There's also a plaque at the front of that building describing what it is. Now, a place that had been mentioned many times as a possible airstrip for Santa Barbara was the Mesa. And this is this area that we see here in front of us is now a shoreline park. And this was really pushed uh, to be an airfield. At the same time this was happening though, oil was being discovered along the Mesa and they're putting in the Mesa oil wells. So it was a race to see what would happen first. And the airfield idea never really got off the ground. But in 1925, it was used as the emergency landing field. Uh, this is the arm, this is one of the army planes that came up to Santa Barbara and was taking photographs and has landed here at the Mesa field. And there's uh, I got a lot of great shots that these plane, these army planes took over Santa Barbara for the 1925 earthquake. So this is the only known uh, time that, uh, as far as I know, that somebody actually landed on the uh, potential Mesa landing field. Well, with this field not happening and the Zenith company finally leaving Santa Barbara and the Lockheeds leaving Santa Barbara and Mr. Ovington being kicked out of his airfield eyes were on Goleta. And so two gentlemen put together a airstrip. This is the this is Hollister Avenue along here. This would be Fairview. So this was the first airstrip, uh, the Goleta Airfield around 1928 or 1929. And it didn't take long because a few aircraft companies came out here, built some hangars. So this is the General Western Aero Corporation. And this is, again, this is Fairview Avenue running along here. And Hollister Avenue would be off the screen below my red dot right there. But you can see the two hangars and the control tower and a great number of cars there for an air exhibition. Uh, over somewhere in this area here was a slaughterhouse. So things didn't smell too good sometimes. But there's the hangars. Here's a ground view looking at the two hangars and a crowd of people there for an air exhibition of some kind or another or welcoming somebody. So the Galena thing did quite well. It got better. And then the city of Santa Barbara decided that we really need an airfield, a top-notch airfield. Airplanes have to come to Santa, airliners, better airliners need to come to Santa Barbara. So the city bought some 500, originally I think it was 580 acres and then later expanded to 800 acres. And they raised a bond measure, I think it was 1942, 1941, had a bond measure for $149,000, which passed. And then United Airlines hired the architects Edwards and Plunkett, the people who gave us the Arlington Theater and many of the other great uh, buildings in Santa Barbara. So Edwards and Plunkett designed the new terminal, United Airlines built it. And so Santa Barbara now had an airport. Now the land was owned by the city, but it was actually out in the county at this time. Well, not long after the, this all went in, uh, World War II started and the US Marine Corps Air Station was now brought into Santa Barbara. This particular uh, photograph from their, uh, one of the air station brochures shows a group of, cross, of US uh, Army Corps, or Marine Corps Corsairs uh, it was Easter Sunday, 1944, and so they're flying in across over the mission, and they also flew over the courthouse. And they spent some $11 million to put this airfield in. And so this is Isla Vista, or this is UCSB out here. And so that's the, all the barracks for the Marines are out there. They've improved all the landing strips through here. Here's Hollister Avenue. And so they've built all these buildings out here. There's the two hangars that we saw earlier and Fairview Avenue coming along here. And the 
up the north side of Hollister Avenue was also part of the Marine Air Base. And so they were teaching people about dive bombing, gunning, uh, they had the Corsairs and quite a few other types of planes to train people for the Marine, US Marine um, Air Corps. And one of the problems, you know, this was an old uh, slough. This whole area was a slough, as you know, from the far side over here, you can still see the slough. This area here was a large mound of Miskalitan Island, which at one time was surrounded by the slough. It was a Chumash, several Chumash villages were in this area. And both the city previously to the Marine Corps cut away on this to start uh, filling in this area and building it up so they could use it for a landing strip. But they cut away quite a bit of Miskalitan Island, both the city and the Marines to uh, build the airfield. And every time it rained, though, it was still low ground. And so every time it rained, uh, it would become a swamp. And that's what the, the Marines actually nicknamed the station. They used to call it the swamp. Or they would get permission. The standing joke was to request permission to land at Lake Santa Barbara. But nevertheless, the training went on. And thousands of, of uh, people were trained out there at the, at the station. Here's a bunch of the Corsairs lined up and a matchbook cover from the U US Marine Air Corps Station. Well, the war ended, the property finally came back to Santa Barbara and we're back to peacetime. Now, one of the things that surrounds the airport, there were 21 street names all honoring the aviators that died, a group of aviators that died in World War II. So when you see uh, William Moffat Road, Norman Firestone Road, Clyde Adams Road, Botello Road, Norman Firestone, all of those were named for aviators of Santa Barbara that died during World War II. Well, one of the problems was that Santa Barbara had this property out here, but it was in the county and it was owned by the city. And the city really wanted to have better control of this because it was their property. So they approached the county to say, can we work a deal? The county was not interested. And so the city was trying to figure out how to, how to get this property and many different things were tried. First, they were just going to get all, annex all the property leading up to the airport. That was too expensive and that wasn't happening. And really the county wasn't interested in owning the airport. So it was Mayor John Ricard who, he actually he didn't come up with the idea, a uh, news press columnist, um, Tom Cleveland, after they tried to out uh, to make the city go past the city limits and buy land out to here, that didn't work. And I think it was Tom Cleveland that made the joke, well, if not by land, then by sea. And so they figured out this, Ricard and the city had already given us preservation off our shoreline to uh, keep us from the oil companies from coming in too close. So they took that city line and they took it, uh, it was some 300 feet wide they made a sh what they call shoestring annexation. It was 300 feet wide, seven miles long, and went out to the out here and came up, surrounded the airport. And so that's how the city ended up having the airport be city property all the way out there. The state was not happy with this, but they couldn't find anything that they had done illegally to do this. But after the city did this, the state passed law so you, no one else could do things like this again. But it's thanks to Jack Ricard, uh, or Mayor John Ricard, known as Jack Ricard, that uh, this we were able to secure the airport for once and for all. Now, some people say, what a ripoff for the city of Goleta. Well, there was no Goleta back then. Goleta was a farming and ranching community. There was no money in Goleta to buy and to maintain an airport. And the city was doing this. It was the only place to really have an airport, and it already existed, so it made sense to do it. So that's how we got that airport out there. Now there's tons of stories that we could go on for the airport um, and, different, and different histories, but one of the ones that so many Santa Barbans remember is aerospace lines. And aerospace lines had been down in Southern California and in 1967, Jack Conroy, the head of aerospace lines decided to come to Santa Barbara. They'd already built two of these airplanes these giant airplanes, and I forget what they were based on. I just, that completely slipped my mind, but he was taking another type of an airplane, expanding it and making it into 
this plane. And when someone first saw it, they said, my God, it looks like a pregnant guppy. So these planes became known as the pregnant guppies. Uh, the early guppies opened at the tail and to load uh, supplies, et cetera. Now here's the later guppies uh, opening at the front, hatching at the front. And this is the Columbia command module for Apollo 11. So this is 1969, Apollo 11 heading to the moon, but not getting there without Santa Barbara's aerospace lines uh, preparing the way. And here's another guppy shot where they're swallowing another airplane inside of it. Now the pregnant guppies uh, were followed by the super guppy. And here's the super guppy uh, at the Santa Barbara airport. And as a kid, you know, I remember seeing these planes go overhead and they were just so amazing to watch. So uh, there's a lot of great stories and some great histories out there about the guppies. A guy named Tom Smotherman is uh, doing a wonderful history of the guppies. And he's got a lot of stuff on Facebook about them. He's almost got, I think he has a guppy page about it. Well, uh, we could also go on to the sports car races at the airport, Tracor Aviation, Lucas Aviation, so much history, but so little time. So we'll move on to the current day. We got our new airport terminal, and here's the old terminal built by uh, Edwards and Plunkett. And it was named for Earl Ovington, our Santa Barbara aviator. The, it was the Ovington terminal. So when they built the new terminal, they jacked up the old one and then moved it over to connect it to the new terminal. I was able to get this great shot off of a uh, aviation video game. So it's one of the uh, fly airplane video things. So here's the Ovington hangar. Here's the new hangar or the new hangar, <laughs> the uh, airport terminal, which was moved uh, in front of the new airport terminal, which was named the John T. Ricard terminal in honor of Mayor Ricard who had the brilliant wherewithal to get the airport into city property. And now we've talked about some of the hangars that have been saved. And so here are those two hangars. Here's the before picture of the two hangars uh, out at the edge of the Santa Barbara airport property by uh, Fairview and Hollister. And Tom Smotherman took these before and after pictures for us. He, well, he matched up the after, he didn't take this, he's too young. So here's what the hangars look like today. And it's a real shame that the city of Santa Barbara owns these. And just think if you were a developer and you had these on your property and wanted to tear them down, they'd make you fix them up, restore them and build them. But here they sit slowly falling apart and rotting. And I know there's quite a few people that are hoping to try to get these restored and fixed back up again, but the city it appears continues to let them deteriorate. And I don't know how far this has moved. And so I'm almost ready to end it right here, but I wanna add a few things for you to, if you wanna continue your Santa Barbara aviation history. One, the Santa Barbara Historical Museum uh, for their, their, court, their historical quarterly called Noticias. Uh, my friend Brian Bird put out this history of the Lockheed Aircraft Company, and it's a brilliantly well done history of Lockheed and how the I didn't mention their mother, Flora Haynes Lockheed, who had been a uh, reporter and writer for the Santa Barbara newspapers in the 1890s. The boys were in Santa Barbara before leaving to go on elsewhere before coming back again. But it's all here in this copy of Noticias. There is also a delightful two hour video of Santa Barbara history called Santa Barbara Aviation History called Above and Beyond, A History of Santa Barbara Aviation. And it was done by John Zuber and Tony Ruggieri and Chris Bell, uh, who worked some of that one time or another. They've all worked uh, for the city doing documentaries. Tony and Chris uh, worked for the city of Santa Barbara's, I think they still do, for their um, TV production company. And also all these guys worked with me to put out a, vi a historical video that I did. We were working on a TV plot. We're trying to do a TV, uh, historic Santa Barbara TV show, and all of them worked with me on it. So it's a great history of Santa Barbara. It's two hours long, well worth the watch. And you can find it on YouTube, just key in Santa Barbara Aviation History. And with that, I would certainly like to thank the Santa Barbara Historical Museum, uh, my collection, 
John Fritchie, the Library of Congress, Lockheed Aviation, the Ovington family, my friend Tom Smotherman, uh, Tom Mondugo, the City of Santa Barbara, and UCSB Special Collections for the photographs that were used and a lot of the histories that I was able to uh, get information from. So a thank you to everybody, but especially to the Historical Museum for hosting these happy hours so that we're all stuck at home, but we can still get our history. So thank you, everybody.